Hello and welcome into the 24-7 Sports College Basketball Show. I'm your host, Adam Finkelstein. And as always, before we get started, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to this 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. We've got a jam-packed show for you here today. First and foremost, we are going to break down the bubble teams you need to know heading into this big weekend and all of the weekend's key matchups. Then, we are going to talk about the coaching carousel because, of course, March Madness doesn't just mean the NCAA tournament. It means we're about to see a lot of movement in the college coaches' ranks. Last but not least, the transfer portal. It opens the day after Selection Sunday, and we're going to look ahead to what we've got coming up with that. So let's get right to it with a look at some of the huge matchups on tap for this weekend. I'm going to bring in college basketball recruiting analyst, sorry, college basketball analyst, pardon me, Freudian slip, Isaac Trotter, to help me break it all down. Isaac, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So we're 10 days away from Selection Sunday. And before we get there, I want to talk about some of the teams that are on the bubble right now. According to Jerry Palm, the last four in, first four out, heading into tonight's action. Utah, they've got a net ranking of 46, Ken Palm of 48. New Mexico, 26, net ranking 36, Ken Palm. Colorado, who plays tonight, 31, net ranking 32, Ken Palm. Seton Hall, net ranking 63, Ken Palm 56. Those are the last four in, according to Jerry Palm, right now. The first four out, St. John's, 36 and 28, net ranking in Ken Palm. Iowa, 57, 49. Villanova, 29 and 29. Pittsburgh, 44 and 43. Isaac, we've got some big matchups on tap for this coming weekend. I know a lot of them have really uh, attracted your eye already. First one I want to start start to you and talk talk about is uh, Duke and North Carolina. Anytime that these two teams match up, it's a huge national matchup for obvious reasons. But there's more potential implications this year as a share of the ACC regular season crown is up for grabs. And both teams are obviously fighting for seeding in the NCAA tournament. What do we need to know about this game? Yeah, it's a huge spot for everybody, right? North Carolina trying to get a one seed. 23 of the last 35 national champions have been one seed, so that's super important, and North Carolina has a great case for it. And then I think for Duke, this is a really big moment for Duke to flex its muscles as maybe the best team in the ACC with the highest ceiling in all of college basketball. Remember, this is a team that we had number two in the preseason poll. We thought that this was a team that could be the best team in the country, and they didn't show it at times, but I think that they're starting to tap that button again. They've gotten back to it, and it's because there's this backcourt, right? Kyle Filipowski gets all of the love, but Jeremy Roach is playing his best basketball. Tyrese Proctor has improved, and Jared McCain is playing like an absolute lottery pick. You add in Sean Stewart's emergence and, and resurgence. He's playing his best basketball at the right time. I'm buying Duke as a national title contender, and I think Saturday is a moment where they can start to flex on the rest of the college basketball sphere and show that they are true one of those elite contenders. All right, now I know you're baiting me a little bit because I'm pretty sure you just said Jared McCain was a lottery pick. Did you mean Kyle Filipowski was a lottery pick or did you mean Jared McCain is a lottery pick? I think I think Jared McCain's a lottery pick. I think he is playing right. at an elite level right now. The shooting off the bounce, the transition threes, I don't think he makes any mistakes on either end of the floor. Just his ability to come in and impact winning has been huge. He plays so free. And I love that about him. I think he's really changed the dynamic of this Duke team. He has leveled up as the season's gone on. He's as dynamic and as important as any freshman as we've seen in, in college basketball this season. He's phenomenal. I would take him as a top 15 pick. All right. Lottery's only 14, though. Just saying. Just saying. He's this year's Brandon Podzemski, the shooting, the rebounding, the IQ. I'll move on, though. I digress. Uh, we've got three number one seeds already locked up. It's obviously it's going to be Houston. It's going to be UConn. It's going to be Purdue. That fourth one, though, is really debatable. Tennessee has a chance to really potentially put themselves in a good position this week with a home win against Kentucky. Break down this matchup for me. Yeah, Tennessee has really just started to play at an elite level. I think they're one of those teams, too, that I would not be surprised at all if they can win the national title. But this game, for me, is all about Kentucky and the measuring stick of how far have we come, right? The last time that Tennessee and Kentucky played each other, Tennessee really big boy this this Kentucky team. One of the worst defensive showings that Kentucky had all year long. And Tennessee's an elite team and, and played like it, right, the last time that they were playing in rough. But I think this is a big spot for Kentucky to showcase that, hey, our defense, maybe it's not solved, 
but it's just good enough to go along with a supernova offense. And I think John Calipari's ability to get this dynamic five-man lineup on the floor with Reed Shepard and Antonio Reeves and, and Rob Dillingham mix alongside with Justin Edwards and Zivonimir Visic has really changed what this Kentucky ceiling can be offensively. And if they can go show just signs of improvement on the road at, at Tennessee, a tough place to play, I think it would say a lot about what we can expect from this group. Because I think a lot of people don't expect Kentucky to be able to win six games in a row in March Madness. But if they can go on the road and flex their muscles a little bit and start to play like a veteran team that's figuring things out a little bit, I think we have to rejudge our, our, our ceiling for what this group could do. You're right. I don't think they can stop people for six games in a row. You're right. Um, on February 3rd, Kansas beat Houston at Fog Allen Fieldhouse. It was 78 to 65. Uh, this week, they're flipping that one. They're in Houston. Houston's got the chance for revenge. Both teams have battled injuries. But my question to you is this, is who is in better shape physically going into this matchup? And what is it going to mean? Yeah, I think Kansas is probably in a little bit better shape physically. And we haven't been able to say that in a while with Kevin McCullers injury up and up and down. But Jojo Tugler's injury is huge. Terrence Arsenal, obviously, early in the year was a really big loss for them. And I think that this is a spot, though, where Houston has to get its defense back in order. Kansas came in with a great game plan. They were able to really pass the ball well with Hunter Dickinson and K.J. Adams. Those decision makers were just really sharp. And I think Houston is going to remember that game, and they're going to come in ready to go and impose their own will. And I still love what this Houston group is all about. You know, a lot of people had doubts on them coming into the, the Big 12 and if they would be able to, to put – potentially be one of the best teams in college basketball again and they've answered the bell every single time and even though the injuries have popped up I'm still buying this Houston team as a team that can make a really really deep run I'm just concerned about the shot diet I'm concerned that they don't get to the rim enough but this is still a group that just plays so so hard they're vicious they're hyenas and I think we're going to see that on Saturday against a Kansas team that might be healthier but I don't think they're ready for what Houston's bringing to the table all right, now I want to talk about the bubble. We've got a Wake Forest team that about a week and a half ago, they looked like they were in good shape when they knocked off Duke. Since then, they've lost three in a row and seemingly are now on the wrong side of the bubble. They're playing a Clemson team this weekend that does not want to feel any pressure on Selection Sunday. So this is a big game. Break it down for us. There's no way that Wake Forest can make the NCAA tournament without that automatic bid if they don't beat Clemson on Saturday. It just It's just not in the cards. And this Wake Forest resume is a little bit different, right? They've had struggles on the road. They really have only beaten anybody of substance at home. Not enough quad one wins to really flex their muscles on Selection Sunday, feel good on Selection Sunday. And after that Georgia Tech game, they played tight in that first half. They have got to bounce back in a hurry against Clemson. But this is a group that the eye test, they continue to pass it at spots, right? Like outside of that loss to Georgia Tech, we've seen them play at a really, really high level. They're good when they're good. It's really, really good. And their home road splits have been really drastic all year long. They're shooting over 43% from three-point range at home. It's about 30% from three-point range on the road. I think they get back and play at a high level against Clemson. It's a do-or-die moment, right? And I think we're going to see the best of Wake Forest. And then they go in the ACC tournament and anything can happen because they need those matchups against North Carolina and Duke on a neutral floor to really bump up this resume to have a chance on Selection Sunday. All right, now in the Big East, we've got UConn. They've already clinched the regular season, but they go on the road to a Providence team that really needs the win this weekend. Now, a few weeks ago, Providence played UConn very close in a game that they said intentionally, according to Kim English, he junked it up, he made it ugly. What do the Friars need to do to come up with the win this weekend at the building formerly known as the Dunk? Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? I think that type of game plan is the exact same thing that you're going to see on Saturday. I think Kim English has done a phenomenal job with this group. Remember, they lost Bryce Hopkins. They're all Big East wing early in the season to a season-ending injury. Devin Carter Jr. has been one of the most improved players in college basketball. He's playing like a first-round pick. Josh Oduru has been phenomenal out of George Mason. And this group, like, they are not the most talented group, but they play so hard defensively. They make you take tough shots. And you have to be on your P's and Q's against this UConn offense. They have maybe the best playbook in college basketball, just so many intricate sets. And if you aren't dialed into the scouting report, you're going to have a hard time. But Providence, we've seen them at moments be able to force a lot of those tough twos. And if you can do that against UConn, you have a chance. So Providence certainly needs this one to feel good on Selection Sunday. I think that their defense is going to be, you know, really the key calling card on, on Saturday if they want to pull this upset. Isaac, as always, you are a wealth of expertise. We know you're going to be watching, writing, and posting all weekend long. We're looking forward to it, my man. Thanks for having me.
All right, one of those games we talked about, Kentucky and Tennessee, live from Knoxville. You can watch it Saturday, 4 p.m. on CBS. That's America's most watched network. All right, and we've talked about Ohio State and DePaul. They've already made coaching changes, and the cruel reality is that we know that's going to be just the tip of the iceberg. We learned on Wednesday that Mike Woodson will be back at Indiana next year, but with a ton of speculation already out there about other coaches, CBS Sports college basketball analyst Chris Walker is going to help us make sense of those whispers. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. I got a little game I want to play with you here today. Uh oh. I'm going to tell you, coach, I'm going to tell you the program. I want you to tell me if the seat is hot, meaning they're in a lot of trouble, if it's warm, meaning they could be in a little trouble, or if it's cool, meaning they're going to be with Mike Woods and they're going to be back next year. You ready for this? I got you. Let's go. All right. Number one, Florida State and Leonard Hamilton. Oh, my goodness. That's a good one right there, Adam. You're already getting get me, get me nice and warm here. You know what? I'm going to say Leonard Hamilton right now. It's got to be a little warm, Adam. Here's the deal. He's 75 years old. They've done a tremendous job of, of bringing in pros. You know, think about it. He's one of those guys has been a stalemate of the ACC, an elder statesman, done a tremendous job. But the last few years, has been pedestrian at best. People know about Scotty Barnes. They know about some of the pros that they've had there, but it hasn't been good the last few years. And Leonard Hamilton has been, again, a coach who's done a tremendous job at Miami, Oklahoma State. But now, I don't want to say it's ageism that he's getting, he's getting a little old at him. It's at the end of the day, things are just changing. The shifting of the Hubert Davises, of the John Shires of that league, it's just looking a little bit different. And when you add in a transfer and portal, which they haven't been lucky at, you add in NIL, things are just looking a little bit different in a place where there have been a ton of athletes and the NBA has you know, just pillaged that program and great, bring great players, I should say, brought great players to the league, but has left that program in a tough spot, porous at best, and they're struggling to compete in the ACC. It's just been tough. And I think it's warm. It's, it's getting close to that time. Uh, for Leonard Hamilton at Florida State. All right, now I got another one for you. And I know neither one of us really like this game, but we got to play it nonetheless. Louisville, Kenny Payne. Again, another tough one. You know, a lot of these guys, you know, you've been in the business a long time, so have I. We're friends with them. But we're just reporting the truth. Josh Hurd, uh, the AD, I know, you know, bringing back Kenny Payne was great for the faithful, you know, played in the national championship, played for Denny Crum, and the nostalgia of bringing back one of your own is tremendous. But after what they've been able to accomplish in that program, and also, Adam, what's going on down the road in Lexington, and then losing, you know, uh, Dewan Wagner's son, it's just been really tough, one thing after another, and they just haven't been able to get a figure on the pulse you're talking about a place in the Yum Center that sells out every single game. The lifeblood, they're good in football, but the lifeblood of Louisville, Kentucky is Louisville basketball. I would love to see Kenny get this thing moving in the right direction. As I mentioned before about Leonard Hamilton, unfortunately, freshmen don't get it done. You have to find a way to find some pieces in the transfer portal. And I might add, when you hire uh, someone like Kenny Payne, who's never been a head coach, you have to ask yourself, is this a situation where you got to win right away. He was it wasn't a handover situation. There wasn't much talent there. Or you got to give him the time to do what he did at Kentucky, do what he did at Oregon, and build talent. And then you have to hope that the coaching piece comes later. And you, it's just what the commitment to the uni, of the university is. You want to give him time to grow as a head coach, or do you want to judge him based on trying to build the program. It's tough. These guys get paid a lot of money. They got to put their big pan, big boy pants on. And I might add, him, he's in a tough ACC conference, which doesn't make it easy. Now, couldn't agree more with everything you said, but we are saying it's the hot seat, right? It's, no, it's, it's beyond hot. It's like it's the, the sun hot. <laughs> just, just, the sun hot. just wanted to make sure. Just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. All right. Now, Michigan, Juwan Howard, hot, warm, or cool? You know, I'm going to say warm, but only because uh, 
again, you're talking about a guy who's been to an Elite Eight National Coach of the Year, been to a Sweet 16, uh, you, know, you know, the heartfelt part of having a heart problem this year and overcoming it, Bill Martelli being the elder statesman on the staff taking over, losing Kobe Bufkin a pro, losing his son Jet Howard to the NBA, uh, losing Hunter Dickinson to the transfer portal. Again, nothing that any other of these other programs at a high level don't have to go through, but this is Michigan. You know, the team just won a national championship. You know, it's just a very different eye of the spectrum that's on this program. You know, he had the incident with the strength coach who's now resigned. And there's too much fodder around the program, and it's not about basketball. Uh, hopefully, again, Ward Manuel came out and said that, you know, right now there's nothing that they're looking to do with that position. But you know how things change. And they just haven't played well, Adam. That's the thing. There's losing, and it's just not playing well. And it, the program doesn't look, look like it's moving in the right direction. Think about a national coach of the year, elite eight, to where we are now. You know, heart problems aside, they got to figure some things out. They got to get back to being Michigan that we believe Michigan can be. And you started off the this hit saying that Ohio State uh, is changing coaches with Chris, Holt, Chris Holtman. Think about it. Michigan and Ohio State, two of the programs that have been killing it in this league forever, are at the bottom. I mean, something that we've never seen in a very long time. So, Jawan Howard, he really has to get things moving in the right direction. And the best thing about it is they won a national championship. So who really cares about basketball right now when football's doing so well? But at the same time, you know, Michigan, they're a very proud program. And, uh, you know, they're accustomed, as long as Tom Izzo's doing well in East Lansing, the people in Ann Arbor want to win as well. Now I'll tell you a program that's doing a little bit better this year in the, in the Big Ten, and that's Fred Hoiberg in Nebraska. Coming into the season, there were expectations. There was a revamped contract. Where does his seat stand as we speak? I think he's, oh, if the mayor, they call him the mayor, he's cooling out right now. I think he's put himself in a very good position. You know, that league is not hard to win, and I think it helps, uh, as I mentioned, you know, that Ohio State's struggling. Michigan is struggling. And, and then Michigan State has just been okay in that league, and Northwestern is in third place. So that now you set up a situation where Nebraska has a chance to rise. I'm going to give Fred you know, his credit because he's labored through this league. He took over for Tim Miles, who took him to the tournament. They end up moving on from him. And Fred Har Harburg obviously had success at Iowa State, but having it to do it a different way, Nebraska is not one of those programs that's known for basketball. And he's trying to change it. Ty got a great home court advantage. But at the end of the day, you know, like I know, Adam, when it gets close to the NCAA tournament, you heard Isaac earlier, you have to keep winning. You can leave nothing to chance at the end of the year like this. And when you have programs that don't have that name brand, you want to leave it up to the committee and you have a losing streak, recency bias, people can say what they want. It still applies to teams like Nebraska. It doesn't apply to the Dukes and the Carolinas. But if you start losing at the end of the year and they got a chance to put a name brand in there and you leave it up to them like Nebraska, it's tough. But I think he's done enough right now to say that he's in a good spot moving forward. Yeah, just got to win one on the road, right? I mean, that's, that's been Nebraska's yeah. thing all year long. Winning at home, can't buy one on the road. Uh, now I want to talk about Oklahoma State. Mike Boynton struggling, but he's been outspoken now, talking about the NIL and saying, hey, it's not like when I recruited Cade Cunningham and I could just be the hardest working guy and be in the gym the most, and that was going to get it done, said now that doesn't, that doesn't take you over the finish line. So what do we make of where he lies with his job right now? Hot. You know, it's just he's in a tough spot. You know, and the other thing is I think the COVID, I mean, the, the, the investigation with Lamont Evans, that particular year he had a chance to go to the NCAA tournament as well, so that's not helpful. You know, you had to hire his Kate Cunningham's brother to get that player, and it worked out well, but it has not worked out well since. And now you add some of these teams like the BYUs and the Houstons to the Big 12 and in Central Florida and Cincinnati, and they are, have all outperformed him as well. It just has not looked good. It's trending in the wrong direction. Mike is a really good man, but at the end of the day, it's about wins and losses. Oklahoma State, a proud program, lots of money, lots of resources. Got to get it done. All right, now we're going to turn the page to Stanford. Jared Haas, they brought him back. They said they wanted to see progress. They were really banking on an impressive recruiting class from last year, including Pedro Stojakovic's son. But I don't know that they've won enough games this year. What do we make of his job security at the moment? I mean, as a major heat check, of course, it's extremely hot. The question is, what is the commitment of Stanford? What do they want to do? Uh, haven't made the tournament since he's been there. They've had pros 
You know, I was in the league at Berkeley when they were there. I mean, they just have had a ton of good players. It just hasn't worked out. Covered his games when he was at UAB. I mean, a great man, tremendous coach. They call him the human floor burn when he played at Kansas. But at the end of the day, you can get five-star players. Dyakovich and Stun came in. You can get those type of players to come there, but you still have to win. And I'll say the Pac-12 has not been a great league. So it's a place, even Cal having some upward surge, and Stanford just hasn't been able to do it. Jared Haas is, a, a, again, a really good coach. At Stanford, you can get really good players. They've almost had a lottery pick or a first-round draft pick every year, and it just uh, has not translated into wins. So, again, they moved on from Johnny Dawkins, and I think it's really time to move on from Jared Haas. That seat is very, very hot as well as it should be. All right, last but not least, going to stay in the Pac-12, or at least what was the Pac-12 this year, and that's at Washington with Mike Hopkins. You're going hot, you're going warm, you're going cool. I mean, very hot. Uh, I mean, uh, Jennifer Cohen, who moved on the AD at USC now, I knew that thing was super hot then, and he had one more year. She moves on. Here he is again. You're talking about a guy who started his first two years in the Pac-12, being the coach of the year, going to the NCAA tournament, had Martise Thie- Matisse Thibel and Jalen Noel trans- uh, recruits from Leonard, uh, uh from Lorenzo Romar, who moved on and just hasn't been able to get it done in the league. This year had six graduates. They did some work in the portal. They had Keon Brooks, who's their leading scorer, brought in Savia Wheeler, Paul McCahey from Rutgers. It just hasn't worked out, and it's just trending in the wrong direction. You know, thought to be the head coach of Syracuse a long time ago. It just hasn't moved. Again, the guy I played against when he played at Syracuse, I was at Villanova, uh, want to see him do well. It's just been really tough in the pack. And again, another program like Michigan, they are great in football. It's been a football change. The question is, will they care enough to buy him out or let him continue while football's winning at the level they're winning at? I can't argue with any of that. I appreciate you uh, joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Absolutely, brother. Take care. Thanks, Chris. All right, to keep up with the latest on the upcoming coaching carousel, be sure to subscribe to 247sports.com. Right now, there's a 50% off promo on an annual VIP membership, but it ends on Tuesday, March 19th at 11.59 p.m. That means don't wait till midnight. All right, this year, the transfer portal opens the day after Selection Sunday on Monday, March 18th, meaning whether you're still playing this year or not, you better be working on next year's roster. Portal's going to be open for 45 days, and it will close on May 16th. All right, to help us break down what's on the horizon, we're going to bring in 24-7 Sports National Basketball Analyst and the guy that I like to call the czar of the transfer portal, Travis Branham. Trav, uh, between all the lawsuits with the NCAA this year, the court rulings, the recent statements about collectives talking directly to recruits, it seems like this year in the portal is going to be vastly different than anything we've seen even recently. Can you break it all down for us? Yeah, this is actually a year, if you go back into the preseason, we're all expecting this to be a little bit uh, more solidified. All these guys that transferred before, you're expecting expecting them to stick around or else they'd be penalized. But after the initial lawsuit in December, everybody is now planning that the NCAA will not be penalizing anybody that transfers more than once. In other words, it is going to be a complete free-for-all, and everybody's assuming no matter how many times you've transferred before, you're going to be able to transfer again and be eligible next season. That goes for college coaches and all the people from agents to grassroots coaches and high school coaches that help these players in this decision-making process. That is the assumption that the majority of them are operating under. But that's not the only big change. Just last week, the NCAA released a statement basically stating that they will not be policing these collectives from talking to recruits. Before, collectives could talk to current players once they are on campus and helping with their NIL and marketing, but they were not allowed to talk to the guys during the recruiting process. That is going to start changing as long as it abides by state laws. So in other words, I, what I believe will start happening is physical contracts will be delved out during the recruiting process. So what's going to happen is a lot of players will end up hitting the transfer portal, getting these contracts in writing so you have it guaranteed or else you're, the collective is liable uh, for a lawsuit and vice versa. It becomes leveraging and you can start negotiating with other teams. So a lot of players this year, uh, especially going back to that initial ruling, 
we're going to see more players hit the portal, but solely for leverage, just to kind of run up their NIL money and uh, return back to their cool, their school. Okay, so you think you're going to see guys, even if they may want to go back to the place they're at, put their name in the portal, basically just to open negotiations. Is that right? That is 100%. All right, so this, this is going to be uh, Wild West, uh, capital W, more so than anything we've ever seen. And the point we made earlier, which I think is, is really relevant, this starts the day after Selection Sunday, meaning you've got teams preparing for the NCAA tournament who are going to have to simultaneously be juggling this. So what I want to ask you about now is some of those teams, some of the bigger names in college basketball, and talk to you about who they may be targeting, who they may be losing as we look at it. One team, the defending national champions, UConn, they've got a chance to repeat this year. We know they're going to be one of the four uh, number one seeds in the NCAA tournament. What are they going to be looking for in the portal, though? Yeah, they're going to be having their hands full trying to make it to the Final Four and another national championship. But the guys that we know will absolutely be gone are basically irreplaceable, starting with Tristan Noon and Cam Spencer. Starting with Spencer, they struck lightning in a bottle. And this is a player, first time into the program, going to be extremely hard to replicate. And finding a player who can come in out of the transfer portal and make this type of immediate impact he's made this year is very difficult. So they're definitely going to need a score and shooter. And then talking about Tristan Newton, a triple-double threat, the guy that has really evolved uh, throughout the course of his career at UConn uh, and become one of the certified best point guards in the entire country. So that is another uh, spot that they will have to be hitting hard. And then we are expecting them to lose two stars in Donovan Klingon and Stefan Castle. Now they will be returning and bringing back uh, some returners, some particularly young guys like Jaden Ross and Solo Ball that they will continue to develop. But this team next year will be needing experience, another guard, and then again, scoring, 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 and potentially will need another big as well. Yeah, you bring back Alex Caravan. You look at last year's recruiting class, give them all an elevated role. Guys like Solo Ball, Jaden Ross that you mentioned, going to be interesting though because historically they've gotten one maybe two guys out of the portal they may need more this year all right we said mike woodson he got that vote of confidence from indiana they said he's going to be back next year but to me this looks like a roster that could require some wholesale changes i'm assuming kalel Ware is going to go pro what do we expect from the hoosiers approach to roster construction in the coming weeks yeah nobody has a more crucial transfer portal cycle than mike woodson moving forward he only has one guy signed in his 2024 recruiting class, and that is five-star Liam McNeely. But again, as you said, they need a complete revamp of this roster. This season, they had high hopes, and it has been pretty miserable, if you ask me. Uh, they're well outside of the bubble. And yes, it is expected that they will be losing their lone bright spot in Khalil Ware. And then they'll also be losing a guy in their point guard, Xavier Johnson. So this team will be in the market for absolutely every single position, from additional bigs, and particularly what has been absent this year in glaring has been the lack of shooting. So they're going to need a lot of shooting, a lot of scoring, experience, and guys, I think, that need to be coming from winning programs at the mid, at the mid-major level and whatever you can get out of the winning programs at the high major level. I want to talk to you about Kansas. Eric Bossy just wrote an article about true seniors that could opt to return. Obviously, Hunter Dickinson, one of those guys, has his COVID year back. Uh, Kansas done great work in the portal in recent seasons. What are we to make of the next few weeks coming up for, for Bill Self? Yeah, Hunter Dickinson absolutely remains the biggest question mark on this roster. Now we know they're going to be losing a star in Kevin McCuller. And they're also going to be likely losing another young star that we didn't anticipate in Johnny Furphy. Uh, so this team is going to need to have a big portal class. They do have a pretty impressive freshman class coming in. But the guys that they need to kind of redeem this season for Bill, from Bill self standards, they're going to need to get some older guys, especially at the point guard position. They're going to need a lot of shooting. That has, again, been a glaring issue. Dewan Harris and K.J. Adams are expected to be back. But Hunter Dickinson will remain the massive question mark. And for attacking this portal and planning accordingly, they're going to need an answer out of him as soon as possible. I may be crazy, but I think his earning potential is higher in college basketball than it is in any other basketball conference in the world. But I guess we will see. Want to ask you about the another blue blood in your home state, 
Kentucky, not only are they got, you know, everybody's worried about who's going to go to the portal. I think Kentucky's trying to figure out who's going to the draft. And then if they don't go to the draft, are they going to the portal? But there's a lot of uncertainty in Lexington right now. No question. They are the biggest question mark amongst all these teams. And just how many kind of variables are at play here? And as you said, who's going to be going to the draft? Now there is a lot of talk around Lexington. Could Reed Shepard capitalize on the NIL and come back for a sophomore season now? He's projected in the top 10. I don't foresee that happening. And we would imagine that Rob Dillingham will follow suit, um, as will probably G DJ Wagner and Justin Edwards will give it a go. We know they're losing a star in Antonio Reeves, and then likely, and we'll also be losing Trey Mitchell. So there's a lot of guys that we know will be gone. But the variables re re revolve around guys like Ugana Kingsley, Adu Thero, Big Z. What's going to happen with these guys? So all those answers uh, will they will need all those questions to be answered to know how to attack this portal. Now we know just even if they do return, they're going to need a lot of agent experience because they do have a large freshman class. So they're going to need leadership around these young guys to kind of bring them in and show them the ropes of not only just college basketball, but high major basketball and life in the SEC uh, to just continue to keep this boat stable and rocking. So inst instead of rocking the boat so much to say as we have seen uh, throughout the course of the last three seasons in Lexington. All right, now the last one I have for you, a program that's done very well in the portal in recent years, and that's Illinois. What are we to expect from them? Yeah, we know they're losing some extremely key players in this one with Marcus Domask, a, a transfer portal breakout star from the last offseason. Terrence Shannon Jr. made his way from Texas Tech uh, up to Illinois, who has been, again, another star cracking on NBA draft boards. Both of those guys are their leading scorers, so they're going to be losing quite a bit of buckets. And then Quincy Garrier, we know they're losing him. And then big question marks are around Coleman Hawkins and Luke Goody, particularly Hawkins. He is at, at, in his fourth season, in his senior season. Will he exercise his COVID year and come back? Or will he exercise his COVID year? Potentially test the portal. When we see these guys can finish their four years out of school, it's pretty common to see them enter the portal and just go find uh, some new grounds to just kind of get in a new system and experience something different. So what's going to happen with him? So all that to say, they're going to need a lot of scoring in this next class. They are definitely going to need a point guard to, as they kind of continue to mold and evolve. Jace Butler, who's going to be a freshman next season, who, again, we have him in the top 100. But coming into a, an experience in older Big Ten, you're always going to need somebody to kind of lead the way so these guys can find their footing. So they're going to need a point guard, need a lot of scoring, and then depending upon what Coleman Hawkins does, they're probably going to need two or three wings. Well, Trav, all I can say is I hope you are well rested because this is going to be a long couple of months for you, my man. Uh, but I know you will have us all covered, 247sports.com. As I said, he is the czar of the transfer portal. All right, everybody, we have got a big special episode coming up on Monday, March 18th. Coverage begins at noon Eastern time. Now, if you've been paying attention, you know that is the day after Selection Sunday, and it is the day the transfer portal opens. So we've got the bracket analysis and transfer portal special. Be sure to check it out Monday, March 18th. Coverage begins at noon Eastern. And as always, we want to thank you for being here. Thank you for watching the 24-7 Sports College Basketball Show. We will see you on Monday, March 18th.